The Northern Crops Institute, also called NCI, is located on the campus of North Dakota State University, one of the leading cereal grain research institutions in the world, located in Fargo, North Dakota. Northern Crops Institute conducts research on pasta and related products in their laboratory. Major Fortune 50 companies use this laboratory and pilot plant on a regular basis. Many well-known products, including many of the gluten-free pastas available today, were developed at Northern Crops Institute. One of the leading tools they have at their disposal is the Demaco 250 lab press. This lab 250 was placed in the 1980s and has been in use almost constantly since. Major food companies use the Lab 250 at NCI routinely as part of their R&D operations. Other companies purchase Lab 250 presses or will rent a lab press from Demaco. Riley Morgan is the lead pasta research technician at NCI and will demonstrate its basic functions. Hi, my name is Riley Morgan. I'm the processing project manager here at NCI. And uh, I am responsible for operating a variety of equipment mainly the pasta press which you see here in the background but we have a twin screw uh, extruder upstairs it's a winger tx52 and we have um, also have a pilot mill that we can swing back and forth from hardwood spring wheat to durum wheat um, and also i'm the point of contact first point of contact in regards to setting up projects here at nci so if you're interested in doing anything you'd want to contact me and you can find that information on the internet there or whatever. Anyway, um, so NCI is a facility that's primary purpose is to educate people on how to use food, our, our crops that we grow in this region in their food. You know, in the region Montana, Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota. Um, so, and then we also do the research and development work too. That um, we also educate people that way. Private companies, private label companies that uh, want to do some testing and stuff like that. We would do that work for them, but uh, obviously we wouldn't be sharing that information with anybody. That would be confidential. All of that is confidential information that would be only be used by the company that is here at NCI. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to put the press together. As you can see, it's not put together yet. Uh, so the head's not on there. There's some other things that are missing too. The first step we want to do is we want to make sure that we coat the the extruder barrel, the inside of the extruder barrel with mineral oil. And then also I'll bring over the the screw and uh, you gotta coat that too. So that's, a, that's our first step we wanna do. All right, so here's the screw, fits in the extrusion barrel. Just like acts like a big auger. Um, it acts like a pump, moves the material from the mixer into the, into the barrel, from the barrel into the head. Um, we have a resting area that we have on our machine that you wouldn't necessarily need to have on yours. Um, right at the end, there's a double flight here right at the end of the screw, which would help to work that dough and to develop the gluten matrix a little bit more. So um, I should probably show you the end of this. There's a little keyway on the end. And uh, so that is going to hook up with your... Um, basically your motor in the back there's a keyway on that on that pulley and you just need to find that keyway and some are e easier than others I'm sure this one is a little tight so I kind of have to give it a little push and uh, so I'm just plugging that hole because if you don't plug this hole you know you, you get that hole all filled up with uh, with dough and I won't be able to, I have a special kind of tool that I use to pull it out, like a screw extractor, and it screws into here. If it's full of dough, I can't do that. So that's the first step to uh, putting the press together. And we need tools. To put the press together, you need tools. Another reason for the double flight at the end is to distribute the temperature of the, of the dough a little bit better. So it chops up the dough and, you know, your, uh, your outside's not hot compared to your inside or your inside's not hot compared to your outside. You get a nice even distribution of temperature as well. Now I have, my, I have some of my tools. So I'm going to just uh, screw this bolt in. All right. And I have already 
pre uh, lubricated these with machine grade machine or not machine but food grade machine oil excuse me so we've got some machine grade or food grade machine oil on there so then we're just going to tighten all these bolts in and then we'll put on the 90 degree angle head and yeah so all right basically this resting zone is a it's kind of a special piece of equipment that we had made as well uh, it, it helps out with our shaker table that we use and as you'll see and it helps out with uh, our cutter so we can actually put air on the product as it's being cut um, it gives us space to be able to do that um, not not a standard piece of equipment with the rental unit um, just to let you know we'll add the head on right now and here it is we've already taken air there's a port for the pressure die pressure and a port for the temperature and so this is what it looks like and uh, when we start making the pasta you'll see it comes out like a rope so all right so I'm just gonna put all these bolts in when I get done We'll tighten everything up. Um, obviously, if you don't tighten everything up, you're going to have dough getting squeezed out everywhere. So you'll find out real quick if you haven't tightened it up. We'll put our temperature probe in that would go right here. It's actually in the dough. And uh, the pressure, die pressure um, as well, we'll, we'll do that. And uh, let's see here. Would you need, well, I mean, would you need a, a, a pressure sensor or a die? It would be nice to have a die pressure sensor. It would be nice to have a, a temperature sensor as well. Um, you know, if, if, you get the temp, if you get the product too hot, if it gets above 55 degrees Celsius, you will denature the proteins. They'll start to break down. You'll see that in quality when you go to cook it and texture as well the texture won't be as good you have to really cloudy water you'll lose some stuff so um so it's nice to keep track of that aspect so right now i'm putting in the temperature sensor right now there we go so you can see that's what that looks like i'm going to get a i'm using a torque wrench so I don't want to over tighten the bolts. All right, so there we go. I kind of like to do the alternate alternating method of tightening. I don't know if you have to. I don't just kind of the personal preference, I guess. Before we start putting our hands in the mixer or put our hands in an airlock, for example, or we'll start working on any type of equipment at all, we'd want to have the power turned off to the machine completely. The lever that controls the on off would be locked out by a padlock and you would have the key to the padlock. In fact, you would have put the padlock on that switch or lever yourself with the key in your pocket. So that way, nobody can accidentally turn on a piece of equipment while you're working on it. Um, obviously, that would cause great bodily harm. So we wanna make sure that you're, you're using lockout takeout. On the you know on industrial size models, all of these, you can't remove the paddles and all of these are have been welded and grinded and uh, for sanitation purposes. 
So there's no problems with sanitation on an uh, industrial size model. I'm going to go ahead and put this in. And just so you know, the, you know, <laughs> this is the paddle you want to put in first. And so that's the one that's closest to me right now. You always want to put that one in first. It's just, from my experience, it's easier that way. So um, I'm going to go ahead and put it in. And so, and you'll see, I don't know if you could see back here, but maybe I'll just screw this in real quick and then I'll get my hand out of the way and then you can see. Um, so right there I have the bolt up and on this side I have to put the bolt in underneath so they're opposite. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're now when you're putting it together. Now the other paddle isn't the other paddle isn't like that. So um, the head of the bolt is on you know is up on one end and up on the other. I'm going to just move this all right so we're going to put that next paddle in and uh, just to let you know our paddles are labeled so this on this end you have your odd numbers one and three and on this end you have your even numbers two and four so I've already put in one and two now we're putting in three and four um, they're labeled at the end and the the piece uh, well, that mount that it goes onto is also labeled. So I'm just going to double check and make sure that I've got this right. Okay, so we've got number three there. So I've got it right. I'm going to put it in. Got it seated on there nicely. Um, if you have troubles putting on these, if you have trouble putting the bolt inside of the where it needs to go, it's usually it's a, a problem where you don't have the the paddles seated on that mount properly. You've got a little bit of space in between there and it's not the screw doesn't want to line up or the, the bolt doesn't want to line up with the female part of the process. So anyway, I'm putting it in right now. There's no problems. I've I have that paddle properly seated on those mounts. And uh, now we're gonna be doing some tightening of the bolts. We'll put this on and this uh, doesn't have to be all that tight either. I just hand tighten it and uh, I like to have the water come out like this rather than this way. Also uh, I should mention on most of these presses have a pre mixer and we don't have enough space here. Um, our ceilings are way too low to have a pre mixer although it would be nice to have one. Um, it increases your mixer capacity about 30%. Um, yeah, so it, it's a good thing to have. Um, now I think we're getting to the point where we can put in some semolina into the process and start. Uh, we've got everything put together. We're going to uh, just double check and make sure, sure we got everything tight, which I'm pretty sure we do. And then we're going to start putting in material into our feeder start feeding material into the mixer and start making some pasta. While the mixer's feeding up, we'll go through the whole flow and the whole system and all that good stuff, so. Okay. So we're just about ready to put some semolina into the feed hopper. We when you do projects here or when we do projects here at Northern Crops Institute we oftentimes will provide the flowers whether it's hardwood spring wheat flour or um, or semolina and we always get it from the North Dakota State Mill so it's the largest single site mill in the United States um, and it is a state-owned mill so it's very unique um, so I'm going to put some semolina here look at that later we'll just go right down through the system we'll, we'll go to the extrusion barrel now so uh, we're just going to go through uh, the flow real quickly um, as the mixer fills up you can hear probably hear the mixers running right now 
this is where it all starts. And you, you saw me pour some semolina in here. It's feeding right now. We're feeding it at 72 kilograms per hour. You know, it's going to change if you use a different dye. That kilograms per hour will change depending on what kind of dye you use. Uh, open lots of surface area like a spaghetti dye. You're going to want to, you know, your, your uh, kilograms per hour is going to go up. Be like around 76. These right here are load sensors, so we're doing a loss and weight feeder, which we like to do just because it's more precise, but you can use a volumetric feeder too. Um, you're, we're just ensuring that we're getting 72 kilograms per hour um, all the time, whether it's full or empty. Right now, I think we have like uh, 25 kilograms in there, maybe less. Anyway, there's four screws. You can see them right here. Well, you can see these are the four screws that are monitoring the they're metering the, the flower in through here to an airlock. I don't have the vacuum on right now. And if you're running raw pasta, you don't need, you don't need to pull a vacuum anywhere in your system. But uh, in our case, we like, to, we like to pull a vacuum in the mixer. Uh, and um, if you don't pull a vacuum you, when you're doing dry pasta, you don't pull a vacuum, you get little white spots all over in the in the pasta, they're air pockets or what they're, little tiny air pockets. Um, it doesn't look good. I don't think it really affects quality all that much, but it doesn't look good. It, it looks like something's wrong with your pasta. So aesthetically, it's not the best to do. Um, so I'm gonna just stop this. I'm just gonna briefly uh, take you through the system and how, it, how the system flows. You, you saw me earlier add semolina into the hopper here. I just wanted to point out it's uh, these are load sensors on our hopper so it's a loss and weight feeder system which is a little bit more precise than the volumetric and that just basically means I'm feeding right now at 72 kilograms per hour. Um, it's going to be feeding at 72 kilograms per hour whether it's full or almost empty. So you know it's just a precise more precise system. A, a volumetric system would work fine too. Um, there's Four, four basically augers or screws that are in here that are metering the material into this right here. You can see it falling through there into an airlock because I'm pulling a vacuum. I'm pulling a vacuum at the mixer because if I don't, when I go to dry my pasta, I will see uh, several, it'll look funny because there's air pockets in there, little white pin prick air pockets all over. Um, so I don't want that in there because it doesn't look uh, very good not very aesthetically pleasing to the eye. I don't think it affects quality at all. Um, you wouldn't really necessarily need to do a pull a vacuum. You wouldn't need to pull a vacuum at all anywhere if you were doing a raw pasta. Um, so, you know, as long as we're here at the mixer, I'm adding water um, into the system. You saw me put that nozzle in. Generally, on my system, um, I have Basically, it's a calculated dough moisture that's it's based on a formula of how fast I'm feeding, what the actual dry ingredient moisture is, and it's based on how much water I'm putting into the system. I look at my computer screen, and it says 32%. That's where I like to start. Um, however, you know, if you were to actually take this dough out and, and use the moisture tester on it, it might be more like around 30%. Um, because it's more accurate and I'm pulling a vacuum. I'm pulling out some moisture with that vacuum. There's no question about that. Also, um, one thing I should mention is I, I haven't taken a, <laughs> I haven't, I haven't taken a, a actual moisture test of my semolina for this run, but it's been in storage for quite some time over the winter. And winters here in North Dakota are very dry, ambient humidity, like 14%. So I have a pretty good idea that this semolina is like at 8% um, moisture, which usually fresh semolina or fresh flour will come in at like 13%, if not more, uh, on, the, on the moisture side of things. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, I've been, I guess I'm more, I, I'm experienced, you know, so I can look at the, look inside. I know where to start the water and I can look inside the mixer and see, yeah, that looks good. And we'll probably do that when we come back to this. 
I'm going to turn the mixer off right now because we're full. And then we'll go further on down the line to the, uh, to the flow, to the extrusion barrel. All right, so we're currently going from that transition from the mixer into the extrusion barrel. This is the barrel right here. It's a jacketed barrel. In fact, um, I'm heating it up. Well, the water going into the barrel is about 35 degrees. I'm actually, will be taking temperature away or heat away from the system. You know, I don't want to get that dough too hot. So we're going to be taking heat away at 35 degrees. If you, if your water's too cold, then you actually um, kind of create an insulation layer on the outside of that barrel and it doesn't, um, it's not very effective and it doesn't take the heat out like it's supposed to. So, you know, the water bath for that is right here. So I'm putting, I've got it set at 35 coming in. I've got a, a temperature probe right here and another one down here. So it's, it's letting me know uh, the temperature in and the temperature out. This is the optional resting area. It's kind of, as I mentioned before, kind of a special thing for NCI. And from there, it, you know, I, you saw the kneading plate. The kneading plate is right here. It gets kneaded. The dough has a chance to rest, kind of come together a little bit before it enters a 90 degree angle head. This is where we would add our dye, right here, underneath here. Uh, this is the temperature probe that's actually in the dough as it's moving through the system. And this is the pressure, uh, dye pressure uh, sensor right here. Um, I should mention this water bath right here is uh, for the mixer and it's being peristolically pumped into the system at 40 degrees Celsius. Everything when I talk about temperature is in Celsius. So we just want to make sure that we have an accurate measurement on things um, and we'd like to have the 40 degrees water going into the mixer in order to pop properly hydrate things, especially when you have large particle sizes and small particle sizes. If you were, you know, which often, quite often at NCI we are, and have it go through your extrusion barrel. And you could, you know, do the same thing with your mixer water as well. So we just finished up with the, the flow of the dough going through the system, um, you know, all the way to the die. Pretty soon we'll put on a die. Uh, but I just kind of wanted to show you the screen that I referenced earlier uh, in regards to the calculated dough moisture. We're basically finished up with that flow of uh, the dough all the way out to the die. We haven't put the die on yet. But I wanted to kind of show you the screen that I, I referenced earlier. This is the screen that we have all of our processing parameters on. So when you, a company comes to do a uh, test, we can have data for them so that they can see, well, this is formula number one data. Now, in the plant, this is uh, all automatic, automatized, and it's very uh, user-friendly for operators. Um, but in our case, since it's a testing facility, we need, you know, we want to uh, be able to have a good record of everything that happened, because if you don't write something down, and it didn't happen. Um, so basically, I just kind of want to go through this you know, that's our, our dry moisture input right there at 10.64%. As I mentioned earlier, I haven't taken a, you know, I haven't taken an actual measurement of the moisture. So that's just from the last time I ran. This would be because we don't have anything uh, operating right now. We don't have the mixer going. We don't have water going into the system. We're not going to see a calculated dough moisture. We're not going to see the feed rate. Um, you know, the, the mixer vacuum is not going to show a number. The water flow rate's not going to show anything. The milliliters per minute will not show anything. This actually is the uh, temperature and relative humidity in our batch style dryer, the static dryer that we have. So like a 14 hour cycle on that. Um, you know, the screw speed, extrusion amps, mixer speed. This is the water going uh, water coming out of the barrel, of the extrusion barrel, the water coming into the barrel. Um, this right here is the dough temperature inside of the mixer. This is the mixer water temperature, was, which is at 25. Usually we run it at 40 degrees Celsius. Um, 
so it's still warming up a little bit. And the other thing is, is we're not running any water over the sensor, so this is kind of like its default right now. Uh, the product temperature, which is taken at the head, which I showed you earlier, and the dye pressure. So I think everything, everything that you, you know, every parameter that just about that you could possibly imagine is there for recording. I think what we will do now is I will, we'll go back to the mixer and uh, I'll vacuum out the mixer and I'll show you the transition from the mixer into the extrusion barrel and then we will we'll start uh, extruding some material out of the press. All right, so we are now taking the, the dough that was in the mixer, pushing it in, taking it and putting it into the extrusion barrel, pushing it through the kneading plate, which is optional, and through the resting area, and that's also optional, down through the head. You can see this is what it looks like. Um, one thing I did want to point out is the amps, the amperes here, how much energy we're using. It's staying pretty steady at 12%, which isn't too bad. When I go to put my die on, it's gonna go up at least one when it warms up. So initially it's gonna be like at 14 and a half amps, then it'll warm up, it'll go down to like 13. You know, I like to run my machine at like 12 amps. You know, it, generally when you're at 13, you might see streaking and stuff like that on the pasta. Because we have a full mixer, we probably wouldn't see that. So if you have a real full mixer, you could probably run at 13 amps and it would be okay. Now, I think what we should do is put a die on and uh, start pushing some pasta out of a die. Okay, so here we are back at the mixer. Um, it's been sitting for a while, um, so I'm gonna have to vacuum it out. And it's a pretty good idea to have a vacuum um, a wet dry vac, you know, on, on hand when you are uh, running the, your pasta, just so you know you want to make sure that there's no bridging in between the transition from the mixer into the extrusion barrel. Especially if it sits a long time, it'll be it'll aggregate into one big clump is what'll happen. So, but before I do any vacuuming, I just wanted to see let you see what's inside of the mixer here. We've got a fairly full mixer. This is probably retention time of about 12 minutes. That's what's recommended. Um, quite often, I don't run my mixer quite this full. Um, but one thing about having a nice full mixer is it gives you a little bit of leeway um, as far as, well, it gives you good hydration. You don't get any, usually you don't get any specks or spotting on your product, no smearing or any of that stuff. So it makes, it has a tendency to make for really good hydration. And uh, as far as it gives you a little leeway, um, when you're operating, you know, formulas that have lots of different ingredients in them, um, you know, it gives you, it gives you some leeway there where if you're dry, if you're a little dry um, with a full mixer, it's not going to be as harmful because when you run dry material through your press, you have a chance to plug up the press and, and, the, and the screw won't, won't turn. You don't, you don't want to do that ever. If anything, you want to run a little bit more on the, on the wet side. So um, basically, so if you're running something with a lot of fiber in it, you're going to have to add more water, you know. And, uh, and, and with a lot of fiber material, you do want to run a, a real full mixer because you want a good hydration. Um, with, the, with the protein, that's real sticky you know you don't you may not want to run it this full <laughs> because it gets so sticky and the longer it's the longer retention time you have with that protein the more it's going to want to ball up and stick together so a lot of times i know right off the bat when i'm running a uh, high fiber formula i've got to bump up i'll probably bump it up 50 milliliters you know uh, depending on how much what fiber it is. Old fiber is different than whole wheat fiber and that's different from modified food starch, you know, so it kind of depends on what for, what kind of fiber it is. But, you know, you're going to be adding water, 30 milliliters right off the bat, a minute, 30 milliliters a minute. And when I'm doing the protein formulas that are like high 10% protein, I'm going to want to drop my, my levels down again, about 30 milliliters down. And I'm going to want to run with the my mixer not quite as full as as it is now less retention time in other words um 
I'm going to vacuum out right now and then I think we'll be able to take a shot of the actual transition from the mixer into the screw. Okay, so we're done with that. All right, so what we're gonna see here is we're gonna take a view of the transition from the mixer into the extrusion barrel. You can see the flights of the screw there. We're gonna start feeding the material from the mixer into the extrusion barrel, and we're gonna start making some pasta. All right, so we, we just got done looking at the mixer in the transition zone. Now we're gonna, I just wanted to briefly show you the uh, controls I mean, it's, it's, it, this looks like there's a lot of stuff going on here, but it's really pretty simple. You've got your screw that you want to fire up, your cutter, and your mixer. You know, I have a flower feeder right here that, you know, is an optional deal. If I've got a, my mixer's too full, I can just turn it off. It automatically shuts my water off. So my mixer and my, my mixer is tied in with this to the water. So if I hit my mixer, I'm automatically getting water. That's a nice feature to have. Um, you know, these are the, you know, amps right here for, you know, so I, I'm, I have how much energy I'm using to turn the screw. If I've got high amps, I've got a dry mix. I need to add water. And if you get above 15 amps, well, you really should start adding some water at 14 amps, but once you get to 15, definitely add some water because once you get to 16 you know you might not plug it up but you're probably gonna have to take the the die off this right here is just the screw rpm and you can change the screw rpm by turning um, by turning this handle basically um, when I'm running gluten-free pasta I like to uh, I'd like to have a higher rpm on my screw because uh, I like to add a little bit more mechanical energy, a little bit more heat. And we'll talk a little bit more about gluten-free later, but in gluten-free, it's real important that you have heat. Um, so I think what I'll do right now is I'll press this button and we'll start up the screw. There we go. And now we just have to wait a couple minutes for the material to get through the, to the whole flow of the system. It take, should take five minutes. Okay, so before we put our die on the head, I kind of wanted to show you our inventory of dies that we have here at NCI. Um, we own some of them, most of them uh, are, we own some of them, and some of them are, are owned by our clientele who like to come to NCI a lot and do a lot of work. So, you know, he, he, there's quite extensive uh, collection here of, of die shapes. Now, when we talk about dies, I just wanted to, you know, talk about the whole system of the die. You know, dies are made up of a couple things. You have your, your, uh, die holder or your insert holder is what basically what that is and then you have your inserts that would uh, you know they would fit in to here so you could potentially have one die uh, one insert holder or die holder and you could replace your uh, in die inserts with a different type of shape maybe a rotini or what have you now one thing uh, you may see here is I wanted to show you this is that you saw the rope coming off of the extruder and you saw how it hit right here in the middle. Now it's going to spread out. So these inserts that are in the middle of the die are going to have a faster flow rate than the, ins than the inserts on the outside. So we make up for that by using uh, this right here if I can so basically what you have is a, a restriction of the flow of the dough um, you can see how big these holes are compared to these holes so you just restrict the flow of the dough 
in the middle inserts. That's how we do it here on, on uh, you know, in the industry, you, you, these dies have many, many, many rows of inserts. These dies holders, are, they're huge. So how do they, you know, it's, a, it's a, something to keep in mind um, as far as your lengths of your shape and how you want to overcome that challenge. The other thing we do on the dies too is we, we put, well, you can see, I've got a, I suppose that's about a, what a six mesh screen and this is a 20 mesh screen. Um, you know, that six mesh screen prevents the 20 mesh screen from getting pushed into your inserts. Uh, we use, you know, these screen setup like this is used to build back pressure. It's used to um, protect your die inserts as well. If you've got a piece of, big piece of brand, let's say, or, well, this, this fine screen's gonna catch any of that stuff. So it protects your inserts from getting damaged or plugged. Before I put my die on the head, I like to put it in a bucket of warm water and warm it up a little bit and get it pretty close to the same temperature as, as what the dough is. Uh, that way it doesn't take as long to warm up and uh, you, know, you, can, you can start collecting pasta a little bit quicker and you have less variability in temperature. It just makes for a better, better system. So I think what we'll do now is we will move along to putting the die on the head of the extruder and start making pasta. So I'm going to put the die on right now and you get a, so you can get a good look at it. I've got this screen on here. I'm going to uh, put it on, put the bolt in and line up a hole. And you know, it's, I might be, making it look a little bit easier than it is, but um, this is basically how you do it. And then you've got it seated in there. You take your, and just screw it up in there. Um, so you put them in and tighten them up. And then you can start making some pasta before I start pushing the pasta out, or before I shouldn't say before I start pushing the pasta out, but before I put the, the cutter on I like to push the pasta out first and get rid of all this water and stuff because then you'll mess up your cutter if you you put your cutter on there right away this water will squirt out all over the place and it'll cause a mess and uh, so we're gonna take a torque wrench and And we're good to go. So I'll get up here and uh, we'll press the power button for the screw and, and start pushing some pasta through the die. So this is our cutter unit that we have at NCI. Um, and, and I just kind of wanted to show you uh, some of the blades, like this blade, for example, you'd want to use if you were making Orzo. It's got put the potential for four blades on there, so you can cut things a little bit shorter. This is the one we're going to be using with the macaroni. Um, you want to make sure that your blades are sharp, um, and you want to make sure that that this blade, when you, uh, that this blade is always in contact with the face of the die. If you don't, you'll get smearing. And, and that's, uh, you know, in, as far as troubleshooting goes, you know, you could be making awesome pasta, but if you're not cutting it properly, you're, it's not gonna look good. It's not gonna be good. <laughs> so this is the, 
the last piece, but it's a very important piece always to keep in mind. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to take this and I'm going to actually put it on the uh, head, attach it onto the head of the extruder. The, the problem is, is every cutter is kind of different. Um, what I'll do is, the concept though, is what we want. So we'll put the cutter on like that. So I'm, I'm you know, putting this on. Um, so as I tighten these, I'm going to be drawing up the knife onto the face of the die. So, so basically what I'm doing is I'm actually turning the pulley on the bottom, but you can see how that knife blade rests on the, on the die face. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to attach that pulley onto a motor. The motor is going to turn this. And depending on how fast you turn the blade, you'll get shorter product. If you go really slow, you're going to allow more time for the product to come out of the die and it's going to be longer. And we are going to be making uh, macaroni. So, and we'll, you'll see what happens when you cut your macaroni too long. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to install the rest of the uh, cutter unit and uh, then we will when we come back we'll we'll be making we'll be cutting pasta all right so we have started up the pasta press we have put on the cutter we have put on the belt. We're cutting the pasta. We've put in our, this is our, uh, what would I call our shaker table? This is how, you know, we use, we use this. It's real handy for us to use this when we collect the pasta for our testing. It also has air going through it. Just like there's air right here. Coming in, I have the screen off so you can see. Obviously, we want to have this covered up for safety, but I took it off so we could actually see inside of here. But you can see the screen in there. That's where the air comes out. It runs across the face of the die. It runs across the pasta and uh, takes any kind of moisture off of it. And then we have air blowing up through here to take any other excess moisture off of it and to actually move the material down. And we would actually have a tray sitting right here to collect the pasta with. Now, as I'm looking at the length, one thing that you may notice is that is the as the macaroni comes out of the die, it comes out this way, right, well, I'll grab another one. Right there, it, th that end is hitting the face of the die and it's curling up. So we need to, we need to turn the blade faster. So I'm just gonna do that real quick. See a couple good examples. And I'm not sure if you can see um, the actual die we're going to slow it down and see what happens. Or speed it up, excuse me. You need to speed it up. I'm not sure if I said slow it down before. That was a mistake. You need to speed, on it, speed it up. All right, so that looks pretty good. We're still hitting the die on some of them, but not too badly. So I've sped up the, the, the blade quite a bit. If you, uh, this is what it looked like before. This is what we got now. Um, looks better, looks more like it's supposed to look. And we, we don't have the, you know, we don't have that problem where that 
is where that, in, you know, the materials bumping up against the face of the die quite so badly. So I think that's about the right length. You can see too how it's just it's just kind of touching the the die face. The material comes out, it curls, it just touches, and then it gets snipped off. You know that's about right where you want it. So you know we should probably talk about die pressure, amperage. Uh, some things to troubleshoot and to look for when you're when you're making pasta Okay, so We want to thank you for watching this. We hope that it's been beneficial for you We hope that you've gained some knowledge from it and You know, hopefully you can see that the importance of having is a, a Demaco 250 lab press at your disposal because every ingredient is different every ingredient has different characteristics and you know, if you, you test them out on here or rent one from Demaco, you know, you're gonna gain knowledge from that and you're gonna see, you're gonna be able to troubleshoot things and, and you're gonna be able to scale up into production without any problems. So thanks again.